Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming today. I've invited you here because I know Albertans are concerned about our court system and access to justice. I believe they have a right to be concerned because I am too. On July 8th of this year, the Supreme Court of Canada released its decision in the Queen and Jordan. The decision outlined a new framework to be applied to determine if an accused person's rights to a timely trial had been violated. This marked a significant change in the law and imposed presumptive ceilings on the length of time that an accused should have to wait for trial. As a result of the Jordan decision and the new time frames that will be imposed, criminal matters that have been in the process for many months and already have set trial dates may be at risk of being stayed. I acknowledge that there are real, substantive, and systemic issues with the way our justice system has been operating. These problems did not develop overnight. They have built up over several years, even decades. The courts have been quite clear that such delays will no longer be accepted. I want Albertans to understand these matters are critical and require urgent attention. I have been addressing these issues since my appointment and I will continue with that focus. However, the Jordan decision represents a marked departure in the operation of law with little time to adapt. I will not sugarcoat it. The work we have in front of us is daunting and this issue is not restricted to Alberta. We cannot continue with business as usual. The Crown's work to address the backlog and delays in our court system has been ongoing, but has taken on additional urgency in the wake of Jordan. Alberta's Crown Prosecution Service is working hard to handle these additional demands within strained resources. To address these pressures, Crown will be focusing on prioritizing serious and violent cases. The Crown Prosecution Service is working closely with our police partners to ensure that disclosure is expedited and matters can proceed in a timely manner. This means court resources should be used in a manner that's, sorry. <laughs> um, to address these pressures, Crown will be focusing on prioritizing serious and violent cases and working with police. We'll be ensuring that court resources are used in a manner that's proportionate to the, serious of the seriousness of the alleged offense. The Crown is focused on assessing cases as soon as possible in order to allow resources, both on the Crown and court side, to be properly deployed. By doing this, we hope to divert or settle matters early in the process. Early file assessment and ensuring the first offer of resolution is the best offer can help achieve appropriate early case resolution. We have incredibly skilled and dedicated Crown, Crown prosecutors in this province, and I know they will stand up for the best interests of Albertans. I'm confident they will make reasoned and principled decisions, but make no mistake, some of these decisions will be very difficult. Crown alone cannot address this backlog. Another critical component of the justice system is judges. The shortage of federally appointed justices is creating court delays that are a serious concern. Over the last 20 years, Alberta's population has grown by 50%, and the previous federal government, as well as the previous provincial government, failed to address this growing change, this growing strain. That's going to have to change. Since I was appointed Justice Minister, I've been working closely with my federal counterparts to ensure Alberta has the appropriate number of Superior Court Justices. This work resulted in appointments to fill vacancies this past June. Despite these appointments, more vacancies need to be filled. But beyond current vacancies, Alberta needs more Justices. To that point, I would like to announce that Alberta has just passed an order in Council creating an additional nine positions on the Court of Queen's Bench and one additional position on the Court of Appeal. With these new positions, we have 21 vacant positions between the Court of Appeal and the Court of Queen's Bench. These new positions we created would bring Alberta's ratio of justices per capita closer to that of other provinces. Federal Justice Minister Jody Wilson-Raybould 
has said she understands the severity of the issue and is looking at the business case for these additional positions to be funded. Filling these additional positions would require an amendment to federal legislation, so we will continue to work with Ottawa to encourage them to make those changes. I had the opportunity to meet with my provincial counterparts at a meeting of justices, Justice and Public Safety Ministers in Halifax. I believe that over the long term, the constructive and open relationship I have been building with my federal counterpart will deliver tangible results for Alberta. Our courts should, not, our courts should be commended for the work they have done to maximize the number of matters they can hear with the judges currently in place by improving their scheduling practices. Another component critical to the justice system is a, function, is a functioning legal aid system. Despite the economic challenges faced by our province, we have committed an additional $9.4 million in in-year funding to legal aid this year. This represents a 20% increase in legal aid funding since our government took office in May of 2015. This increase brings the total provincial funding for this budget to $77.9 million. At a time when much of public funding has been frozen, I believe this additional funding for legal aid signifies our government's commitment to access to justice for all Albertans. This is a substantial investment and it allows Alberta to catch up to the rest of the nation in terms of funding for legal aid. We will continue to work with legal aid and continue our dialogue with the legal community in order to find solutions to the ongoing fiscal challenges that face legal aid. I do not believe our, our work can stop there. We need to ensure our justice system is functioning in the most efficient possible way while protecting the rights and interests of Albertans. We will continue to listen to Albertans, the legal community, our policing partners, our provincial and federal colleagues, and all stakeholders to build a justice system that Alberta can be proud of. A justice system that is innovative, that is proportionate, and that is evidence-based. The next few months will not be easy as we work to deal with the systemic backlogs that have been building for decades. But these systemic backlogs have taken on more urgent importance in light of Jordan. Thank you very much for coming today and I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, scheduling practices need to be improved? Is this like when we have courts sitting from 10.30 to 3, that kind of thing, and expanding that, or can you elaborate on that a little bit? Um, so the reference I made to thanking uh, judges for improving their scheduling uh, matters was related to both the Provincial Court and the Court of Queen's Bench. Both courts have done a lot of work in terms of scheduling um, to ensure that matters move through in a more timely manner and to ensure that... Um, we, we have some appreciation for the fact that things tend to settle at the last minute. So they've done some really uh, fantastic work in ensuring that justices are available, um, you know, for, for matters that are urgent and critical and need to move forward right away. Uh, but there's only so much that that work can do. Um, so the Crown will be working to prioritize serious and violent matters to, to bring those cases forward. Uh, some of that is going to depend on cooperation from our, depart from our partners in the Defence Bar and being willing to adapt to the new scheduling and to allow those matters to be brought forward. Um, so a lot of that will depend on A, cooperation of the Defence Bar and B, de decisions that judges and justices make in terms of applications for Crown to bring things forward or in terms of ultimately uh, what what they do with the fact that the Crown has been trying to bring those matters forward. So matters that are already scheduled for trial, you're going to try to bring them forward, reschedule an earlier trial date with the cooperation, because I know defense lawyers have already said, well, we're, we're pretty booked, how could we possibly do that? So. Um, Crown Council will be working with them to do that, but each individual case is going to turn on its facts. Um, a lot of what the Jordan case asks our prosecutors to do is to sort of um, reverse that culture where delay is all right and to sort of work more um, 
more strongly with defense counsel to ensure that they are being cooperative in that process um, and also to ensure that they are doing the best they can. So um, we will be uh, keeping track of matters and it'll depend, each individual matter is gonna turn on its case. So they'll do the best they can to prioritize and to move within um, the time available, but each, each individual matter, they'll make that decision in that particular case. Reference tough decisions that have to be made, and, and these are going to be difficult months. You seem to be suggesting, or maybe I'm just reading to it, that will we be seeing many cases dismissed or charges dropped uh, to deal with this? And do you have a sense of how widespread that is going to be? It's difficult to predict that at the outset, so a number of things will depend on uh, decisions that judges and justices have, have yet to make. Uh, so I can't necessarily comment on that. And then Crown prosecutors will be making. Um, those decisions in individual cases, so it's difficult to say exactly what they're going to uh, what they're going to do. I mean, our focus is going to be on um, ensuring early case resolution and ensuring that matters which can be diverted to more appropriate places are so diverted. Um, but yeah, those those decisions will depend on the individual case and the the individual prosecutor. Well, how, I guess how likely is the scenario that we getting away from the serious and violent cases that we will be seeing more, we will be seeing either more dismissals or, or charges dropped or um, an increasing number of settlements. Do you have any sense of how that will play out? Well, we're hoping to see an increasing number of matters settle. So uh, it's my hope, certainly, that we will see uh, more of those as opposed to any other type of matter. But there will be a front end assessment on the strength of the case as well. Yeah, we're hoping to do more of that. We're also hoping to increase opportunities um, for for diversion, so alternative measures, mental health diversion, those sorts of things. Is that, how, how are crowns being directed um, in relation to that for um, for serious and violent offenses? Would, is it a possibility that some of those uh, cases will be settled in a way that they wouldn't have been six months ago? Uh, they're being directed to ask to act in the best interest of, of Albertans and to prioritize those serious and violent matters. Um, we're looking to do more assessment by more senior crowns earlier on in the matter so that we can come to resolutions. And so the, the factors that they usually take into account are uh, the public interest and the likelihood of conviction. We have a couple questions on the line, guys. So we're, we're going to go to the line. We'll come back to the floor. Uh, operator, if you want to put through the first question for Minister. Your first question, it comes from Dean Bennett from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Good morning, Minister. Uh, just following up on uh, how this, this triage system might work, uh, are you giving any sort of broader urging or direction to Crown prosecutors, for example, to perhaps uh, avoid pre prelims and go to, to, uh, to direct indictments in more cases? Mm -hmm. Um, well, matters, uh, matters around preliminary inquiries are in part um, a determination of the courts. So what we're allowed to do with that uh, will in part be determined by the courts. Uh, certainly, that is one of the measures that prosecutors will be looking at. Again, it will depend on the, the facts and the circumstances in the individual case and whether we uh, believe there is a legal basis for that. Uh, and that was actually an issue, uh, those sorts of procedural matters were an issue that was raised at my FPT uh, in terms of uh, whether perhaps some changes in the law around those sorts of procedures uh, might be necessary. But of course, that's within the jurisdiction of the federal government, so I wouldn't want to speculate on what they're going to do with that. And, and this is, Paul, is there a concern here that this could, uh, like, for example, if I'm charged with like, a simple assault under this new system, it's actually in my benefit as a trial lawyer to have a more thorough assessment of the so certainly it's the case uh, that this does place on Crown prosecutors uh, a certain uh, requirement to move as expeditiously as possible, but it is and will continue to be the case that justices will take into account uh, whether the delay is attributable to the Crown, to the system, or, or to the individual accused. So if I'm an accused who's, uh, you know, 
uh, firing my defense counsel on the eve of trial consistently in a hopes of delaying the matter, uh, courts are still gonna consider that that delay will be attributable, depending on the circumstances, uh, to to the accused person, so that won't necessarily count against the time frame. Thank you. Think we have another question on the line, operator. Your next question comes from Kevin Berger from Westlock News. Your line is open. Hi, I was wondering if you, Minister, if you could elaborate on what created this discrepancy between the number of federally appointed judges we have and the number that we need. Has it simply been uh, there the world up um, well, it's difficult for me to speak to specifically how that gap was created because obviously it wasn't around uh, as it evolved. Um, but essentially, the province can amend its legislation to say we think we need uh, more federally appointed justices, but then the federal government has to agree to fund those. So the former provincial government had created some additional positions over the years that were not recognized by the former federal government. Um, in terms of these positions that I'm creating now, we have been working with the federal government. We do have a business case in, uh, and she understands the urgency of the situation is in considering that business case. So uh, hopefully, if we can, we can work together moving forward to ensure that Alberta gets the resources that we need. We have one more question on the line, and then we'll come back to the floor. Your name. Um, well, certainly the position of this provincial government that we need to see the diversity of the population uh, represented in all aspects of government, including the bench. Um, I certainly have an eye to that when I'm making appointments to the provincial court. I understand that the federal justice minister also has that uh, high on her list of things that she considers important. Um, so, I mean, I believe they will be looking at it, but it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, ultimately that will be their decision, but I understand that part of the reason that they want to revamp uh, their federal appointment process is uh, to ensure that it's uh, transparent and reflective of the population. Thank you. Thanks. And back to the floor if you guys have more. I'm just wanting to quantify the number of cases that we're talking about and how do you prioritize? Is it strictly based on the seriousness of the offense? Um, so it's extremely difficult to quantify the number of cases and the reason is that that would sort of be presupposing a judgment that a, a, judge, uh, that a judge is ultimately gonna make in the future. Um, certainly we will be prioritizing serious and violent offenses because we think that those that that's what's in the best interest of Alberta. So given the situation we're in now, we think that the most important thing for Albertans is to ensure that we are prioritizing those serious and violent matters. Okay. Can you specifically say what you mean when you say serious and violent matters? Like what kind of offenses are we talking about? Um, well, I can give you a couple of examples, but it'll, I mean, Really, it'll depend on the individual facts of the case and the individual decision of the prosecutors. But when we're talking about serious and violent offenses, we're talking about sort of uh, aggravated assault, murder, uh, sexual assault, those sorts of charges. I mean, there's obviously the, the list would go on significantly from there. Is, can you appeal the Jordan decision? Is that an option? Um, we can't appeal the decision itself. Uh, when individual Jordan applications come before the courts, uh, Crown prosecutors will look at uh, appealing those individual decisions, but Jordan is a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada, so there's nowhere to appeal that to. Do you feel that my position is enough? Do you, feel, do you think it's going it's to fix the problem of the shortage of judges in Alberta? Um, we have been working very closely with the Court of Queen's Bench, and so they, they feel that that's the appropriate number of positions, and we, we feel that that's correct. So that will bring us closer in line with other provinces. So if you look at the number of justices per capita, it's much, uh, much lower in Alberta than it is in other places in the country, and so this will bring us a little closer to being in line with everybody else. And as of today, how many judges are um, at the Court of Queen's Bench right now? I was going to say, we have those numbers in a chart. It's actually a sort of a slightly complicated scenario. So. I know the Jordan decision was, was 
based around the person being accused. But the question was asked earlier too about people who are on trial who might be gaming the system, trying to prolong their trial. How much have you heard too from, from victims of crime anxious to have all of this expedited versus the people being accused? Um, well, certainly I think that it is not generally, and what I have heard from uh, victims advocates and from victims themselves is that being dragged through a really prolonged court process is not in their best interest. So it makes it difficult for them to heal and move on. Um, so I think that moving things forward quickly is usually going to be in their interest. Obviously, uh, no victim would want to see uh, their accuser go free because a matter was stayed and neither would we. Um, so certainly I think the message that the system needs to work faster will in general, I think, be of benefit to victims. Um, you know, what's what's going to happen as a result of this specific decision may may not be in individual cases. And we, um, we, we truly send our sympathies to those victims. No one ever wants to see someone who doesn't get justice. We have one more question on the line, Minister. So we'll go back to the line and then we have a time for a few more down here. Operator? Your next question comes from Dean Bennett from the Canadian Press. Your line is open. Thanks. Sorry, Minister, can you clarify for me? I thought we already had positions that were filled from the Fed. Um, so that we... Not the case for judges? We have positions that Alberta has created and that the federal government has recognized that aren't filled. We have positions that Alberta has created and the federal government hasn't recognized that aren't filled. And now we have these additional positions that I'm creating that also won't be filled or recognized. So there already have positions uh, that, that aren't being filled. So today we're gonna to create more positions for a federal government that's not filling the ones we've got. So what's the point of this? Is this just trying to put pressure on them to fill this one? Um, well, I think the point of this is is that Alberta needs those positions, and this is one of my signals to the population and to the federal government that I think Alberta needs these positions. Um, but in terms of filling the positions, so appointments were made uh, in June. I I anticipate uh, that my federal counterpart will be moving expeditiously to make additional appointments. I've, I've spoken to her several times. Uh, it has been my experience that she is um, aware of the urgency of the situation, that she's uh, genuinely concerned for Albertans as well, uh, and that she's been a really good listener and that she'll be moving forward on this uh, quickly, but yes, this does create more vacancies, but I think we need to bear in mind that we've seen a lot more appointments uh, happening a lot more rapidly for Alberta under this this new government. And what's the reason for, I think it was asked earlier, what's the reason that we can't get these things filled? Is it because the, uh, I understand the vetting process is quite complicated at the federal level. Is that the problem here, too much red tape in the vetting process? Um, well, the... <laughs> Judicial appointment processes are, I mean, they do involve a lot of vetting for uh, often what I would say are good reasons. These people uh, have in their, in their hands uh, the lives of both accused people, uh, some of whom may be wrongly accused, uh, and the, the lives of, of victims and the safety of the public in general. So I think it is, uh, you know, really important to ensure that we have a good process in place. I do know that the federal government is looking at their process uh, to ensure that it is more transparent because there have been, I think, at times, criticisms of that process. And so they're looking at that. But I understand that there will be some additional appointments uh, that will occur before that has, before that has worked itself out. And we'll take a couple more questions down on the floor. Um, how many, uh, do you know how many cases there are in the system right now that are at risk of being dismissed under the, or stayed under the Jordan uh, principle? It's really difficult for us to do that calculation. And the reason is, is that judges are going to make individual decisions on the facts of their case, but there's going to be questions of how much of the delay is attributable to the Crown, how much is attributable to the, to the defense. Um, there is, I think, at least some portion of direction from the Supreme Court of Canada for justices and judges to consider the fact that, you know, this decision came down and some of these things may already have been in the chute. So the government wouldn't have known about them at the time when the delays were occurring. Uh, so I think there may be some consideration of that. So it's really difficult to presuppose the sort of number of decisions because it's a pretty complex legal uh, 
legal process. At least in Calgary, there's a, some lawyers have already indicated they're making or have made or are going to make applications on that. Do you have any sense of the likelihood that we will see any more uh, cases? Um, so, as I am aware, we have six pending Jordan applications right now before the courts. So, what, what is that? Where does that leave the chances of seeing um, actually charges stayed at this point? To, us? Um, to be honest, I haven't done the assessment in those individual cases. So, those decisions will be made by Crown prosecutors in those cases because. As I'm sure you're all aware, uh, Crown prosecutors exercise their discretion sort of independent of the political level, and there's a whole, a whole series of good reasons for that. Okay, guys, we have time for two more, and then the minister's got to get on a plane. So just, to, just to clarify, so there's a release from the federal minister appointing uh, seven judges, two to the Court of Appeal, five QB judges. Yay! Right oh, here. that's really good news. Uh, did, I guess they, <laughs> that wasn't out before I walked into this room. So <laughs> um, if that's the case, then we are, we are really happy to see that. I think it shows that they're willing to work cooperatively with us, and so I think that that's really important. So that will impact the numbers I just told you in terms of the number of vacancies, so we will do those recalculations for you. Yeah, so that'll impact the news release, you guys. So the news release was before that announcement came out, so we'll have to do some recalculations and get you the actual number of vacancies um, with those new announcements from the federal government. So the five QB judges today are not included in the nine positions that you're announcing, correct? No, so those appointments are to existing vacancies. Um, so we'll we'll rerun our numbers for you. Yeah. We'll probably send out a new release with accurate numbers now that they have announced new appointments. Any plans on having new judges at the provincial court as well? Um, well, currently it's the case that while lead times have been growing significantly in the Court of Queen's Bench, many of the measures that we've been undertaking have actually had the impact of holding flat or even decreasing uh, lead times in some areas of the provincial court. So, uh, so far there's no, there's no indication that that's gonna be necessary, but we will continue monitoring the situation closely. Okay guys, we have time for one more. Will there be more uh, support staff, like court clerks, more positions for them with the added vetting plans? Do you need QB or? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there is some money that will flow from the provincial government uh, in terms of uh, additional support staff to go with those justices. So obviously that money won't be necessary until appointments are actually made to those positions. Uh, it is a lower amount of support staff than is usually the case. Um, the government has been under considerable constraints and we've been working with the Court of Queen's Bench and we understand from them that from their perspective the most important thing is to get more justices in play uh, and so you know we've been working collaboratively with them. Okay guys we got to wrap up. I know you guys are in Denver and Colorado but my question is on this what are you what's your mission what are you planning on doing there? Uh, so the reason we're going down there is just to talk with officials uh, down there to uh, just sort of see what their experience was in terms of the legalization of marijuana. Um, obviously, this is a, a situation that will have a number of complicated factors, and the federal government will set the overall tone, so they'll do the sort of broad rules in terms of how restrictive or not restrictive it's going to be, but the provincial government will need to fill in a bunch of the details. Uh, and so we're going down there to sort of talk about, you know, road safety, how they're keeping it out of the hands of young people, um, how it is that they're uh, monitoring and regulating to make sure that um, it's being sold appropriately, distributed appropriately, uh, grown appropriately. Okay. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. Thanks very much.